The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the importance of stakeholder engagement through Perkins 5 webinar. My name is Brittany Boston, and I am with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support. Before we get into the webinar, I do want to take care of a few housekeeping items. Just so you are aware, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to review and share at a later date. If you have questions during the webinar, you can raise your hand and we will unmute you so you can ask your question. Or there is also a questions pane that you can type your question in as well. So without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Amy Julian. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Julian. I'm the director for the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support here at Illinois State University. And I'm excited to talk to you today about the importance of stakeholder engagement through Perkins 5. What I'd like to kind of walk through as we get started here is our agenda for today. So the things that we're going to look at over this webinar are what does Perkins 5 recommend reg regarding stakeholder engagement? And they do have a quite a big focus on stakeholder engagement through the Perkins 5 legislation. In addition to that, we're going to look at the value of effective stakeholder engagement. We're going to provide you with an overview of the career readiness stakeholder engagement tool that has been put together by Advanced CTE and really has laid that foundation for stakeholder engagement for career and technical education across the country. Then we're going to unpack steps for effective stakeholder engagement. And finally, I'll share some resources with you, both national and local. So that's our webinar today. And again, I will be pausing for questions as we go through. If you do have a question and would like to speak, please raise your hand and Brittany will unmute you. And if you have questions, as I said, we'll pause and we'll go through those questions as we go through the webinar. So let's get started. First of all, Perkins 5, the Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act, affectionately called Perkins 5, provides powerful opportunities to consult and coordinate with stakeholders throughout the state plan, local application development process and beyond. So many of you are in the process of looking at your comprehensive needs assessment. Those have both been disseminated for secondary and post-secondary. And you're in that process of bringing those stakeholders together. So this is a beautiful time to really talk about stakeholder engagement. Importantly, meaningful engagement will not only make these plans better, but also foster partnership and relationships that, if sustained through the implementation, can make a big difference in advancing your state's vision for CTE. So let's look at the value of stakeholder engagement. Let's kind of talk about who our stakeholders are and look at the things that we can do to improve our career and technical education programs across the board. The value of effective stakeholder engagement. So effective stakeholder engagement has a variety of benefits that can advance your vision for CTE. For one, gathering input and feedback from those who are impacted. When we talk about those who are impacted, we're looking at businesses, communities, community-based organizations, parents, and most importantly, our students. We should not forget to include in our stakeholder engagement meetings and when discussing program improvement to also consult with either alumni from our programs or current students. Stronger plans that benefit the inclusion of many perspectives. And that is really what we're looking at when you have an equity perspective to that. In addition, we want to build, sustain, and deepen partnerships and relationships and a coalition of stakeholders that can be your allies as you continue your work. So what you're really working to build through stakeholder engagement and most effectively through your advisory committees, which is a whole nother fun thing to unpack and look at, but that's really what we're talking about is building our stakeholders through advisories, is that coalition of stakeholders that can be our allies as we continue to not only improve our programs, develop new programs, but also share out programs. So how can your plan of be effective for stakeholder engagement. One of the things that, again, we're going to talk about today, so I do want to lend reference and um, acknowledge that the work that we're talking about today is from Advanced CTE. So use the Career Readiness Stakeholder Engagement Tool to develop a plan for engaging one specific stakeholder at a time. Think through the goals for engagement and the methods for engagement of how often to engage each particular stakeholder. And this tool is based off of those from the Council of Chief State Schools Officers, which was developed in consultation with 15 different advocacy groups. The link is here, and when we do share the webinar, you will be able to access that link. So again, a lot of the things we're talking about today are definitely deep, deeply rooted in research. 
So effective stakeholder engagement, and these are the nine steps that the research tells us that we should be looking at. And so we're gonna run through these and then unpack these as we move through the course of the webinar. First one being clarify your goals. Not everyone that you engage with, do you have the same goal or outcome or want or ask from that particular stakeholder? So let's be sure we clarify our goals for each individual stakeholder. Number two, or step two, work with partners, organizations, and ambassadors to identify and engage your stakeholders. Sometimes the individual that you want to get to is also friend, partner, or already associated with another individual. And that is something that can really strengthen that relationship. Step three is essential and very important. It is speak to your audience. Again, messaging is essential to program success. So when you're speaking with your stakeholders, the ask that you have from a community-based organization is different than the information you're sharing with parents or the ask and the way in which you're addressing parents and business stakeholders. So be sure that you're speaking to your audience and not necessarily just the collective same elevator speech for everyone. Use multiple vehicles. And why that we talk about email, phone call, face-to-face -face meetings, not just send out an email and assume everybody has that information. Believe it or not, in some cases, people do not read what is sent in their email. Five, ask for input before decisions are made and use it. And we'll talk about this in greater detail, but it is very important that if you are asking, especially employers and your stakeholders for information, don't ask things you don't actually want their input on. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Keep your material simple and brief. Understand that everybody is busy and we want to be aware of everyone's time. So be concise in your communications. Communicate clearly and often. It is better that they hear from you and know who you are and that you're in front of them than that you talk to them once a year, bring them in for donuts and move on. Keep your team informed. This is essential. Your team is also your voice piece to the system. So you don't want individuals calling and saying, what is going on with this or how can I get some more information on this and your team not knowing what is going on. So keep your team informed. And then number nine in our closing one is turn these connections into long-term relationships. So how do we work to sustain those relationships through step one through eight to allow us to build and evolve our programs? So let's unpack these a little bit, but let's first stop and talk about how do we choose a stakeholder? Who do we want at the table? Who do we want engaged with us? And who do we want to be a part of this conversation? Focus on one stakeholder at a time and be able to think strategically about each stakeholder. Some examples of stakeholders will include your local workforce boards, employers and businesses, industry associations, faculty, both at the secondary and post-secondary level. Remember, Perkins has a big focus on partnerships between secondary and post-secondary collectively, collaboratively working together. Students are a stakeholder, community-based organizations should be a stakeholder, and then civil rights organizations as well. To be a little interactive, is there any stakeholders that you feel are on there that I should not, that or did not mention? Anybody wanna chime in? I'm happy to unmute you. Or maybe throw those in the chat box or question pane. Let's throw those in the chat box. Does anybody have a stakeholder that you engage with that's not on this list? And I know parents is that evident one. Four-year institutions, great, great suggestion. Thank you. Student services, excellent, great suggestion. Again, be sure your entire institution knows what's going on. And let's not forget counselors when we're talking student services for the post-secondary level. We also want to talk about school counselors and their role as stakeholders in your programs as well. So let's go through the steps. Clarifying your goal is step one. And step one really looks at what is the overall vision and goal for your program or for your institution or for, in this case, your community your needs assessment. Define objectives for engagement with the particular stakeholder. Again, what do you want from each stakeholder? And those asks are gonna be different depending on what the stakeholder does and who the stakeholder is. And determine how to engage with the stakeholder and what is the best way to engage with the stakeholder. 
There are individuals who, if you send them an email, they're going to be very responsive. You're going to start up a relationship and you might not ever physically see that person, but they'll be a contributor to your program. There are other individuals who want you to communicate face to face and there are other individuals who the best way to approach them is over phone. But also when you're talking with your stakeholders, ask them how they want to get information. Are they wanting to get information in like a webinar overview? Do they want to get information in a phone call? Do they want to get information on a sheet, a nice fact sheet? One of the exciting effective practices that I've seen is that there is a lead for um, CTE programs who prior to their advisory meetings sends them out a little webinar. So they take about 15 minute webinar or three to four minute webinar depending on the meeting and they introduce themselves again via the webinar. They pre-record it. They walk through this is what we're going to be covering tonight. These are the issues that are going to be coming up. This is where I need your input and puts that all in a nice concise little 10 to 15 minute video short snippet and that way when the individuals do come to the advisory they have that additional information they know what they're getting into they know what's going to be voted upon and they really do have an idea of all of the players that are at the table step two work with your partners to identify and engage your stakeholders determine who makes the best outreach to the stakeholder on current relationships so what sometimes your faculty who are leading the program are possibly not the best person to make that ask from a business partner or a community-based organization. But in addition, sometimes the person who is the CTE dean or administrator is not the best person. It is the faculty. That's part of that discussion with stakeholders. Determine who makes the outreach to the stakeholder based on current relationships. Build on the relationships that you currently have and make those things happen. Asking partners to serve as an ambassador to your stakeholder engagement efforts can also be helpful to re-engage with that partner. So possibly you have an employer that also serves on your LWEA and you want to engage with your LWEA as part of your program. So how do you work with that business partner, partner to possibly be an ambassador in your stakeholder engagement to set up those relationships and to frame those relationships for you? If an ambassador or partner is making an outreach, make sure they are prepared to engage with the stakeholder and make sure they know all the information that needs to be shared and what the ask is or what the engagement limitations and opportunities are. This again is very important. Speak to your audience, make your stakeholders, meet your stakeholders where they are. We live in education and there are so many acronyms that go around. And I will tell you that if you talk to somebody in tech, the acronyms are just as plentiful, but they do not mean the same thing. So be sure that when you're speaking to your audience, you speak to your audience, that they understand your acronyms, that they understand what you're talking about, that they understand the communication. Language is so very important and we don't want the message lost by us using all of our educational acronyms and having those individuals who are wanting to be a part of our process feel disjointed because they're not speaking the language we speak. Bullet two there is share materials ahead of time. This is essential because people want to come to a meeting prepared and that goes back to that little 15 minute overview of the meeting is also helpful, but that's a best practice. So share materials ahead of time. Make sure they see the agenda. Make sure they see the topics that are being discussed so they can prepare and be part of the contribution to the meeting, not just being reported to during the meeting. The third bullet there is to allow sufficient time for stakeholders to respond to requests for feedback and input. If you are asking them for something, if you are asking them for input on something, if you are setting policy within your institution, program, school, provide the stakeholders plenty of time to understand and digest that information and then request their feedback. It is not recommended that you put something on an agenda that is being voted on that next day that then is going to become policy without proper time for digestion of information. So that then brings us to use multiple vehicles, which is step four in this process, which really means use multiple methods of communication. Everyone takes in information differently. And so you want to be able to communicate with each of your stakeholders at where, not only where they are, meeting them where they are, which was step three, but also looking at the different methods of communication. 
if you get 22,000 emails and your email is just going to be one more of those 22,000 emails, that's really not recommended. So what are the methods of communication that the stakeholder wants? And ask them very simply as you're engaging with them, as you've had those meetings, as they're attending your meetings, ask them how they want to be communicated to and with. Do they want it to be a blog? Do they want it to be a video? Do they want it to be an email? Or do they want it all to be weighted or held to this face-to-face -face meeting? Leverage existing meeting and communication methods that are already used. So for example, there's another effective practice that there is a group of individuals around equity that get together and it is led by the Kiwanis Club in this local community. And though that is not the agenda of the day is to do program stakeholder engagement for this particular program, they're able to get that item on the agenda because all the stakeholders that they need are already meeting and in this room. So leverage existing meetings, communication methods that are already in use. If your organization is already sending things out to businesses, don't overlap, coordinate and collaborate. Don't go out on your island by yourself. Also with um, advisory committees, if you have programs at the secondary and post-secondary level, it is strongly encouraged that those advisories be one advisory for both the secondary and post-secondary because that then leads itself to that continued streamline advisement. Thinking about methods of communication for the first engagement and ongoing engagements. So are you reaching out with an email, following up with a phone call, and then having a meeting? Also, when you're having a meeting, are you sending the agenda two days in advance and then sending the video a day in advance and then having the meeting? What are your methods of communication? And again, these are all examples, but it is strongly recommended that you think about what works best for your committee, what works best for your stakeholders, and meet them where they are and engage with them where they feel most comfortable, because then that will yield you the best results. Step five, ask for input before decisions are made and use it. I talked about this a little bit in the introduction because this is so very important. When we involve stakeholders early in our efforts to first build awareness of the issues and then solicit input, so if you're building a program and you're asking for the input of those stakeholders, be sure you ask for it early. Be sure you are clear from the start which issues have been resolved or which, it, which issues are dictated by policy, but basically what things are no longer up for discussion and then which ones need input and feedback. There are policies that shape our programs. There are policies that um, we resolve as educators and within the educational realm. But what do our stakeholders have jurisdiction or opinion or influence or over? And then how do we best engage with them for those input, for that feedback, for that opin opinion? And finally, there are established feedback loops. Allow your stakeholders to understand how feedback will be brought in, when you want that feedback by, and then most importantly, how that feedback will be used. And then you're not done. Report out at that next meeting what has been done with the feedback that they provided. But I, I caution and encourage and cannot stress enough, if you're asking them for something, if you're asking them for input, if you're soliciting input for, from them, be clear from the start about which issues have been resolved, which issues no longer need feedback, and which ones need their input, and then use their input. If you don't want to actually use the input that you think you're going to get, don't ask the question, because you will offend your stakeholders by asking them information that you did not ever intend on using. So step six, keep your materials brief and simple, more simple and brief. Um, be concise in your messaging, easy to understand, develop with specific audience in mind. Yes, this is more work on your end, and yes, this will yield better results from your stakeholders. So when you're engaging with parents, talk to parents about what parents' role would be. 
at both the secondary and post-secondary level. If you are engaging with the WIOA partners, talk about what their role is. Where do they fit into your plan? If you're talking with adult education providers, how do they fit into your plan? When you're talking about business engagement, what is their role? But keep your materials concise. A lot of that information is going to be the same, but some of it's going to be distinguished to be different to talking to your audience. Be sure it's easy to understand. Be sure if you're using acronyms that you explain what those acronyms are and don't just assume people understand what acronyms are or what those are. Um, and be sure that all your materials are developed with that specific audience in mind. Identify the information your stakeholder needs to know and be able to engage with. And then make sure any career readiness or workforce development jargon is thoroughly explained. Again, we speak in acronyms way too often. And we need to be sure that when we're communicating with our stakeholders, that they are on the same level that we are. And for them to be on the same level and in the same room with us, we have to explain our jargon and not use jargon, actually use real English, not just acronyms. Is that clear? Everybody feeling good? We haven't had any questions pop up yet, so I'm going to keep going. Step seven is to communicate early and often. This is really important. Determine where this interaction fits in your overall timeline. Consider looking at your communication timeline for your stakeholders, for your advisory committees. Be proactive in your communication. Communications that happen in a vacuum of information will not really be successful. So be proactive in your communication, communicate early and often, and others will fill your space if you leave space open on your agenda. Back to that Kiwanis example, that's the downside of their um, area, is that they did leave some opportunities for other business and that other business was filled in. Also make sure it is a two-way street. Very important. Stakeholders can reach out to you and provide information and input as you are reaching out to them. So be sure that your door is always open. You do answer their calls. When they do engage with you, be sure you respond in a timely manner. Again, this is not rocket science by any stretch of the imagination, but back to that good customer service, that good responsiveness that we need to be emulating when engaging with everybody, but especially our stakeholders, because at one point or another, we will want an ask from our stakeholders and we want them to be responsive to that ask. Step eight, keep your team informed. We all move at a very fast pace. There's a lot going on. And sometimes we get moving down the road with something really exciting and we have forgot to communicate with our internal team of what's going on. So don't do that. Don't forget to communicate with your internal team. Determine who else on your team needs to know about your interactions with your identified stakeholder. Delegate. It's a rough word. It's a very jumping in and trusting word, but it's a good word to use and it does help you do your job better. So delegate, determine who else on your team needs to know and about those interactions and with your identified stakeholders and then communicate that to your team. So if I'm not in the office and there is a question that comes in from business partners, Jerry's going to handle that, and Jerry will be able to answer any of those questions and let your team know. Make plans for how and when to inform your team more broadly about interactions with the stakeholder. So make sure they know who individuals are and who the stakeholders are. Sometimes in individual realms, people are very important, and they see themselves as very important. And then when they enter the realm of, it in, of this big meeting that you're having with stakeholder engagement, they might not be known and therefore possibly not seen as, as important. So if Bob has always been Bob and everybody knows who Bob is, be sure that when you are engaging with your team and someone is running registration or um, greeting people at the door that they know who Bob is because if you know that Bob will be offended if they don't know who Bob is, then we want to make sure we avoid that situation. So make a plan for how and when to inform your team more broadly about interactions. Um, let them know those things that they want to know. Let them know spellings of names are very important if you're going to put up nameplates of any kind, things of that nature. So be sure you keep your team informed. And step nine, this is our last and final step. Turn new connections into long-term relationships. Determine how you will communicate the results of the stakeholder involvement to him or her. 
as we talked about earlier, you're going to ask for their input, you're going to look at ways in which they can engage with you, and then you're going to report back to them how you use their input. Always let them know, always communicate back the results of their involvement, and always thank them for their involvement. If you and this stakeholder are not actively working on something together, establish how often you will check in. So possibly this particular stakeholder, when we look at that list, it's pretty broad, might not have something that you need to be talking with every single day, or maybe they don't come to your monthly meetings, they just come to your quarterly meetings. So establish how often you will check in with this particular stakeholder, and who will be that designated person to check in if it is not you as lead. With some effort, the stakeholder can become a valuable partner in your long-term your long goals. In addition, there are stakeholders that can start with program support that then could elevate to college support and college involvement, which is always a great thing. Or at the secondary system, local support moving into institutional support for the school. Think of how we can use our stakeholders and think of how businesses do engage with our programs, but at the same time, be sure that when you think about stakeholders, you're not just thinking about businesses because the stakeholder is a much larger group than just business. So with that, I want to pause for questions now. Um, we do have some resources, but those are the nine steps. Any questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions pop up, so I'm going to share some resources with you. Um, again, all these links will be activated. This is the College Readiness Stakeholder Engagement Tool. There are additional Perkins 5 tools available. Um, included on that is the CCSSO. Um, let's get this conversation started, including strategies and tools to examples and resources to help states engage with stakeholders and develop their implementation ESSA plans. These are both from ESSA. These will also be uh, adapted and adopted for Perkins. And then include steps on ensuring that stakeholders get and stay engaged with their ESSA development plan. Again, these are on advanced CTE, and they also have options for Perkins or have been updated to include Perkins language. It's the same link. The last, res last resource there is the State of Career and Technical Education Employer Engagement CTE. This is a wonderful national report from Advanced CTE that examines the employer engagement landscape with a particular focus on ways in which states can foster, and locals as well, can foster and sustain meaningful employer engagement to strengthen their CTE system for all students through policy and practice. What I do want to clarify and I want to make very clear is Perkins does have a focus on stakeholder engagement and business engagement. This is not to be confused with being business led or having business lead the conversation. Career and technical education is an educational initiative and should always be looked at as an educational initiative, but business does have a role and they are a stakeholder. So let's be sure that we include them in the conversation, but I just wanted to make that clarification. So I do have a couple questions that have popped up. The first one is, would the PowerPoint be available on the ICSPS website? Yes, it will be. Um, this PowerPoint will be available following the webinar. Give us a couple days to get that formatted and up, and then we'll um, notify you when the webinar is up. And then are there any other types of meetings? You mentioned advisory committees and Kiwanis that colleges are planning to use or are already using as methods to gain input from stakeholders. Great question. Um, there are several different groups depending on your community. Illinois is a very um, eclectic state and there are a lot of different communities in different areas. And really let's look at, let's kind of unpack that for a second and look at where and what stakeholders you want to look at. So I'm going to pop back here. Oh, not that far back. So when you're looking at local workforce boards, 
that might be a little different than employers and where do people meet. So with employers, I would say if you're not involved with your local chamber of commerce, that is a great way to engage and be a part of um, employer engagement and stakeholder engagement that way. Um, industry associations, do they have meetings that they are already going to within your local area and can you attend those meetings? Your faculty, both secondary and post-secondary. So again, be sure that you're looking at what your current faculty are doing in your college area with your secondary faculty are doing in their area and then are those faculty talking crazy question are we actually communicating collaborating and coordinating our programs of study because we're supposed to be so might be something to consider where are those or and if they don't have an avenue for when they do come together you might want to create that avenue for them to come together your students again don't forget students and parents but those might be a tougher one that is a separate meeting. So you want to engage your alumni, unless if your alumni association does have a um, great group that does meet regularly, and if they do, attend those meetings. Community and partner organizations, churches, support systems, things of like that within your community, they are meeting. They're meeting regularly. So be sure you, if you don't invite them to your advisory, how else can you engage with them and meet them where they are? And then there are several, several rights unit organizations that also with community partners will be meeting at separate times. So where can we engage with them and see where they are at? Um, again, there are several groups within the community, within your community that are meeting. And so engaging with them is pretty important if you want certain input, but it, back to the, to the message, be sure you know what you want from them and be sure you're meeting them where they are. So the slide with the list of nine. I can go back to that slide, yes. And again, this will be shared. There you go, that's the nine. And this information will all be shared as well as the recording. Any other questions? So I'm going to go to our final slide here and just thank you all for your time today. Thank you for being part of the conversation. Um, this, as part of our professional development series, is supported by Illinois Community College Board. And again, my name is Amy Julian. I'm the director for the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support here at Illinois State University. That is my email there if you have any questions. We are excited to be a part of Perkins 5 and be looking at what Perkins 5 can do for our system. And I cannot stress enough that right now is your opportunity to have voice. So there are a few listening sessions that are left. Um, if you are not aware of those, contact me. I'm sure all of you have seen them in your emails, but participate in the listening sessions because right now we are listening. The state is listening. People are listening. I'm, I'm always listening, but people are listening who make decisions. And um, we want them to hear what is important to our local constituency. So that's my last little plug there. Um, are there any other questions? If not, I'm gonna wish you all to have a great day. All right, with that, thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon and um, we will let you know when the recording is available.